In October of 2022, there was a moment that occurred in the world of competitive League of Legends that was such a shock to esports fans, people nearly lost their minds. This moment was exciting, heartbreaking, the sort of thing so unbelievable to everyone watching live, a rational viewer would say it was scripted, but this moment was special because it really happened. On the biggest stage in esports, two League of Legends players met up in bracket to determine a champion. But this wasn't just any old championship, this was the conclusion to a story decades in the making. Over 10 years of narratives and competition and grief and determination were shared between these rivals, all of which began years earlier, back when they were teenagers at their hometown high school. This is a story so remarkable, you probably know at least some parts of it already. But even so, I can say with a bit of confidence, it's a story that's never been told quite like this. Oh, Death gets grabbed and that could be deadly. They're gonna drop the solar flare, but Death doesn't make it out. Hard back up now, there's a nice deep Take, just by pushing into the Oh, there it is! Slash and death with the room pressing. Oh, the Q lands, and that's gonna be the kill. Hope not needed. Faker! Just Here it me. comes! Oh, the poor man talk into the slicing maelstrom from both parties as King Zone are gonna be double. This story begins, like any good story does, with a person so spectacular most didn't believe he was real. On the outskirts of Seoul, South Korea in early 2012, a teenage kid sat in his room grinding away at League of Legends. He played under the username Gojongpa and was getting good enough that people started taking notice. By this point, League of Legends was a well-established eSport in Korea. Even though the region had only been given dedicated servers at the start of the year, there was already a domestic professional league underway, a hyper-competitive solo queue, and some players playing well enough they were making international headlines. Everybody is there though. Oh, the bandage was barely with the flash does it! It's Mad Life! Shen coming in as well! How in the world do you get to be that good? The first players to reach pro status in Korea were mostly those who already had experience with MOBAs or esports. Some had been playing League for years prior, doing so on the North American servers back in Season 1. Others had come over from the professional StarCraft scene or other top-down strategy games. The wealth of experience these players had was part of what led to them being the first to rise up the solo queue ladder, joining early esports clubs, and earning the title, the first generation of pros. For a while, they got to be the exclusive members of a very tightly knit competitive community where everyone knew everyone, which is what made it so surprising when this new face showed up out of nowhere. In July of 2012, Go Jung Pa broke into the top 50 on Korea's solo queue ladder for the first time, hitting rank 26, shocking everybody. None of Korea's top players knew who this guy was. Nobody recognized his name from the StarCraft Pro scene or from the NA ladder in Season 1, but here he was, ranked alongside some of the top players in the game, outplaying all of them. Oh, that's good. Ah, Shen is coming! <laughs> Most players in the scene didn't believe he was real, almost literally, as they thought this account must be a smurf. It was common practice back then for single players to own multiple accounts that they leveled to the top of solo queue, so it made sense to assume one of the top mids in the region was probably doing that again. 
how else could this unknown player hit top rating and with so few games played? Nobody realized that the truth was much simpler. This was just a kid, a teenager, who had recently been filled with dreams of trying to go pro himself one day. One month after cracking top 50, Go Jung Pa continued his climb, hitting rank 6, and as the rank 1 player was signed away to a team, that made this solo queue star the highest rated player in the game not already associated with a pro organization. Of course, he didn't stop there. By the end of the year, Go Jung Pa was rank 1. It was toward the end of this grind that everyone came to realize this player wasn't a smurf, but instead a star in the making. At the end of 2012, Go Jung Pa committed to esports full time, dropping out of his local high school to do so, a decision that would prove to be surprisingly wise as he'd find all sorts of success after changing his username at the start of season 3. Clubs realized the rank 1 player on the Korean server was a promising unsigned prospect, every pro team in Korea started throwing offers his way, in part because he played the most important role in game. In many ways, mid lane is the linchpin of a professional League of Legends roster. Mid serves as one of the two main carries on a team with a centralized position that makes it relatively easy for a player to assist other teammates. On top of that, most champions played mid lane scale decently well during all phases of a match. Carrying 1v5 in League is never easy, but if there was a role best equipped to do it from minute one, it would have to be mid. Being such a hot commodity gave Faker plenty of choice for where he'd go to start his pro career, so he naturally chose to sign with the best of the best. SK Telecom T1 were a team that had a storied legacy. Originally formed by one of the greatest StarCraft players of all time in 2002, SKT competed for years in Brood War sponsored by a Korean business giant. Across the 2000s, this team made a name for themselves in esports as they became arguably the most successful and dominant club in a certain era. They'd go on to train some of the greatest players and coaches Korean esports would ever see. So naturally, when the org moved into League of Legends in 2013, SKT seemed like the obvious place a young prodigy like Faker should take his talents. But there was a bit of a catch. By the time Faker chose to sign with T1, they already had a main lineup. SKT had signed a lot of talented first-generation Korean pros, building a super team that was already competing to win a title in Korea's top league, OGN Champions. Throwing a rookie into the mid lane on this roster might disrupt their plans or hurt his development, so SKT decided to build an entire second team specifically around him. This B team, SK Telecom T1 2, was an all rookie lineup made up of a series of prospects picked specifically to complement Faker. They all had promise, but were seen as future stars that could develop their talents while the team's main lineup went off to win championships today. Even if they were meant to take things slowly at first though, nobody on this roster did. In their first ever competition, SKT2 played well above the organization's expectations as they won a qualifier that placed them in OGN champions right alongside their sister squad. That, of course, meant Faker was about to make his professional debut much faster than anyone anticipated. Not only that, but his first ever series would be one hell of a matchup, as SKT were drawn to face CJ Entis Blaze, one of the most talented teams from OGN last year, with a mid laner many thought was the best in the region. Between the pressurized environment of their competitive debut, as well as the skill of their opponent, most spectators thought this SKT roster would have a bit of difficulty at the very least in this high-stress game. That's what made it so shocking when Faker did this. I was curious to see how well Captain Jack would do in this lane because he's been typically uh, a relatively weak player. Whoa, whoa, Ambitious! What? Faker just executes Ambition in that mid lane. Stop taking attack. Actually, look at this. A big tower dive. They're going to come down this bottom lane. Captain Jack, the first target. And Lust Boy's not going to escape either, I don't think. He's going to flash. Maybe we'll get away. No, there's a spear. A double kill for Baker. What a statement by this solo queue hero. Man. And it's going to be two more kills for SKT. They're going to go after these Nexus turrets. It looks like the game is over. So, despite some, uh, you know, a little bit of a tense moment for SKT, they're going to come in and win the resounding game one against CJ Blaze. What an impressive start for these guys. 
SKT obliterated Blaze in their OGN debut, mostly off the back of Faker. It was a shocking performance that instantly got everyone hooked on watching to see what this squad would accomplish for the rest of the split, and they did not disappoint. Across the rest of spring, SK Telecom T12 won nearly every game they played, finishing group stage in first place, easily qualifying for playoffs, where they continued their dominant run, sweeping another top club, Najin Shield, in their first best of three series. They only finally appeared mortal in semi-finals when they lost 3-1 to a team named MVP Ozone, which sent them to the third place match, but they bounced back there, 3 0 that series against CJ Entis Frost. This meant Faker, in his debut split, had qualified for Korea's top league, escaped group stage, swept his first ever best of series, and finished with a top three placing. Any rookie putting up that performance in their debut would instantly be heralded as a well-deserving star, but for SKT, this would be their worst result all year. It was such an explosive start to his career that rocked the world of Korean esports. Onlookers almost forgot to notice there was another Korean rookie that made his debut that very same split. Hyuk-Q, otherwise known as Deft, was another one of the stars rising up the world of competitive league in Season 3, who oddly enough shared a scary number of similarities with Faker. Both were born the same year, five months apart, raised in Seoul, South Korea, on opposite sides of a river that splits the city in two. When they grew older, they each attended the same high school, and although they never had classes together, at 16 years old, they both dropped out to pursue a career in professional League of Legends. But while Faker appeared to be a naturally gifted superstar, seemingly destined for greatness, Deft had a much harder road to take. Deft originally fell into online gaming through playing a Counter-Strike clone named Sudden Attack, mostly just for fun, never thinking much of trying to make a career out of it. He was just a shy kid who didn't have many friends at school, so playing online games was how he managed to socialize. By the time he was in high school, Deft had developed a small friend group who enjoyed playing PC games together, and in 2011, his friends suggested they all try out their first MOBA, League of Legends, which had just been released in North America. They all began their journey making accounts on the North American server in Season 1, and Deft was the worst player among them. When Deft first started playing League, he struggled in making the adjustment of moving from the FPS genre to top-down strategy games. Additionally, playing on high ping, connecting to a server halfway around the world, wasn't a very enjoyable experience, especially for a player who'd go on to dedicate himself to the most mechanically intensive role in League. AD Carry is the other damage-dealing star for a team opposite mid lane, although one that's a bit more finicky, ADCs play on a much more remote corner of the map with less opportunity to roam and help out struggling teammates. Additionally, most champions played in the role start off matches relatively weak, not able to do too much until they scale to their true potential in the later stages of a game. Although Deft may have started off as one of the worst players in his friend group, he wanted to change that and began grinding away at League, trying to improve. He started to get better as early as Season 1, but his improvement really began to hit its stride when Korea had their own dedicated servers released for Season 2. Across 2012, while Faker was at the top end of the solo queue ladder, Deft was quietly grinding away matches in upper to mid elo. He still didn't have much thought of going pro himself, seemingly playing League for a simple love of the game. That all changed, though, when in preseason of 2013, Deft shot up in rating to a point where he reached the top 10 ranks on the ladder. The moment he hit such high elo, OGN coaches began adding him in-game asking if he wanted to try out for their team, which gave him the idea maybe he could go pro. Following in Faker's footsteps, Deft dropped out of high school much to his parents' dismay, joining his first pro gaming team, the MVP Organization. It was an exciting start for a player who'd go on to have a long career, albeit one that began somewhat slowly. Unlike SK Telecom, MVP were a club that didn't have much history to speak of. They were formed only a year prior as a StarCraft II clan, now dipping their toes into League of Legends. Additionally, by the time Deft joined MVP, the team already had a star AD carry named Imp, 
one of the top players in Korea. He was piloting the organization's main lineup, MVP Ozone, and was looking like one of the brightest stars in the team. This meant Deft, like Faker, would be relegated to the squad's rookie B team, MVP Blue, which saw a pretty brutal opening year of play. In their first splits, Blue struggled heavily as the team failed to find any sort of chemistry with their all-rookie lineup. Across spring 2013, they'd wind up dead last in their group, well below their sister squad, as well as Faker's SKT roster. Being a league pro could be pretty brutal, which almost gave Deft feelings of regret, thinking maybe dropping out of high school to play video games wasn't so smart. Not only was the life of competition, practice, and coaching pretty fierce in Korea, but since he was just a rookie, Def's salary was crazy low, leaving him so poor he wasn't able to buy fast food without asking his parents to lend him money. That 2013 spring split provided some unexpected motivation though, as that was the split that saw MVP Ozone topple SKT in semi-finals. Ozone then went on to win that season's Korean championship off the back of their AD carry Imp, providing Deft with a bit of inspiration. If the team's sister squad could go off and win a title, maybe Blue could too. Soon, Deft was taking all the advice he could get, particularly from Imp, who was happy to give him tips, especially after a couple of drinks, and from then onward, Deft started improving a lot. Across the rest of 2013, the young AD Carey began pulling off a few moments of brilliance. If you watched a random Blue series that year, you'd likely witness at least a few awe-inspiring plays from Deft, who started putting everything together to a point where he was outplaying a few of Korea's top stars. And Zephyr coming in, and they're going to knock Chunju Chun back in the box. Oh, wow, he actually gets him. Deft may be able to finish Gorilla off, too. It looks like he will. Oh, it's so close, but there's a missing shot for the double kill for Deft. A great counterplay by MVP Blue. Those were some nice moves by Deft. Not only that, but Deft also began developing a really solid fundamental understanding of League, wrapping his head around the game on a macro scale. He was playing with such solid technique, many veterans in the scene couldn't help but take notice. I was about to say, Deft has been a hero of this game, except for that true shot barrage, <laughs> but um, his positioning has been so good. And he doesn't really have a big score, but you can see in his creep score and the way that he's created these huge zones that he's just been having an absolutely fantastic game. Yeah. He's the reason why the turrets have been dropping for MVP Blue. And of course, he had that insane play up in the top lane too. This was a player that was starting to look like he might have the makings of a pro in him after all. There was only one issue still plaguing Def's gameplay, which was tilting. Anytime a match started to go south, Deft couldn't help but get frustrated, allowing poor situations to affect his gameplay. A match might start off fine, for example, until something goes wrong, like an ally's death. This will set Blue behind, leaving Deft feeling pressured to do something drastic, which only leads to a silly mistake setting the team further back. Your team refuses to surrender and it's been like 40 minutes. You just Jeff ditch all your items. Not defending his Nexus turrets right now. He's, He's just, trying to make the plays. I guess so. Go, go Draven. Oh, oh well. Goon, does he have flash? No, not quite. But he does have rune prison. That's pretty good too. He has his ult to catch up. He yeah, just used his ult to right. give himself extra movement speed and yep. ran him down. This was a pretty normal problem for any league player to deal with, especially a rookie, and Deft wanted to fix it. Around this time, he'd take to watching horror movies every night in the hope it might toughen him up mentally. In 2013 OGN Summer, Deft and Blue did show some improvement, but it wasn't enough. This was still a rookie roster who got knocked out of groups again, with their low point being a humiliating series against Faker's SKT. Because we do see Faker come in, immediately blow up Chunyang wow. in one rotation, and that's Faker's mechanic. Deft has a big part to play in this story, and we'll get to his greatness later on. He just had a very normal debut year, one you'd expect from a kid on an all-rookie roster. But seeing how rookie squads normally developed just made Faker and SKT's run all the more impressive. In OGN Summer, SK Telecom T12 one-upped their spring performance, finishing group stage with a perfect 6-0 record before sweeping quarterfinals 3-0. This sent them to semis where they got to enjoy a perfect revenge series against MVP Ozone. Coming out on top this time around sent Faker and SKT to their first ever grand final, where they'd now have to play for a championship against their organization's biggest rival. 
Korea Telecom and their esports team, KT Rolster, had history with SKT going all the way back to StarCraft. KT were one of the only other clubs able to consistently produce great Brood War players that could match SKT pound for pound. After a while, these two orgs constantly found themselves facing off against each other in grand finals of major Star League events. So frequently, in fact, fans dubbed their rivalry the Telecom War. Naturally, when League of Legends overthrew StarCraft as the biggest esport in the country, both clubs set up teams and were now about to face off for the first time in this new game for an OGN title. And here he comes to try. Oh, here he comes. Yeah, Score, Arcade shifting away. And they're waiting. There's a snowball on the bottom. But will they get it? Will this be first blood? It will be, but it will be for Score. They trade. It's gonna be a jump breaker. Oh, a double kill for Score! A huge beginning for him. Piglet having to use his ultimate to get away. Coming in and just 100 to zeroing people. And that's gonna set up a dragon. Insect, he may go in. He might go in. There's a cross storm over the wall with the flash. A huge engage for KT. Immediately, SKT on the run. A double kill for Tristana Piglet. Showing what? that they're still dangerous even when they're this far down. Yeah. I feel like if they. Uh oh, and here oh, comes Score. Oh, here comes Score, yeah. Coming in over the top. Impact is right there, though. Needs to be careful. He Gets does killed by Piglet. a super minion, actually, and that'll be it. That is Finals started off lopsided, with KT taking the first two games of the series, threatening a sweep if SKT didn't get their act together. For any other rookie team, you'd expect them to fold under the pressure, because after all, they would now have to reverse sweep if they wanted to win. Of course, Faker was up to the challenge. While they were low, but instead... Oh, here we go, the all-in on Ryu! Deathmark has been activated, and Ignite helps him get the kill, the turret not quite Go for it, here we go. Speak it, going for it. SKT comes in, immediately takes out Ryu. Jumping onto Kakao, he's the next victim. Score and Mafa not lasting. A great Cyro ultimate. Double kill again for Faker. And it is an easy, easy ace for SK Telecom. Up. Yeah, Mengi comes in on Insect. They're gonna do some damage to him. Faker rushes in. If they can get Zack out of the way, and they do. What a huge move. Suddenly, the supports have been in trouble. Ryu gets taken down. This is SKT's fight. Goodbye, score. Double kill for Faker. Score in the back lane. Score has to back off a bit. Kakao very low. Mandu coming in over the top. There's Piglet jumping into the base, trying to do the damage. The crescendo hits everybody, but it's too late. Piglet already has a double kill, make it a triple kill. And there's the coach, there's Koma looking at his team looking at the team that's going to force a game five. SKT pulled off comeback victories in both of the next games to knot the series up 2-2, sending the orgs into a final game five tiebreaker. In OGN at the time, there was a rule that stated all game fives would be played in the blind pick mode rather than draft, meaning there were no bans and teams could simply pick the champions and compositions they thought were best. This meant there was a possibility that both teams might end up picking the same champions in the same roles, which occurred twice in this game five. Both top laners picked the meta tank Shen, and both mid laners picked the hyper carry assassin Zed. As the final match began, everyone in the world was watching to see who'd end up as Korea's champion. The game swung back and forth for a while, leaving viewers on the edge of their seat until the waning hours when Faker pulled off the greatest outplay in League of Legends history. You have just Faker nightmares. You wake up in a cold sweat. You're like, Faker's behind me. I know, right? I'm like, even though I only have a bat on the floor, I think he's in the bed. Oh, Faker may be in trouble here, Deathmark. Tries to clean it up for Ryu. Oh, look at the cleanse. Look at the moves. Faker, what was that? Faker with a huge what? play, the QSS. I can't the believe I just saw he that. actually won that duel. I can't believe SK that happened. SK Telecom I'm just charges mind. into the KT Bullets base. Oh, wow. Can you say GG? This highlight clutched game five for SKT and won Faker his first domestic title. SK Telecom were Korea's champions, and perhaps more importantly, they were about to head off to their first international event, Worlds, representing Korea as their number one seed. Ironically, that world championship ended up being much less exciting than OGN Summer because of just how dominant SKT were. 
After only dropping one game in group stage, SKT swept through the event with ease, proving Korea was the best region in the world. They crushed last year's world champions in quarterfinals, played a tough series versus Korea's number two seed in semis, and managed to sweep China's number one seed in grand finals to win Korea's first world championship. Gonna go down. This could be a 20 minute game for SK Telecom. They will be the season three world champions here at the Staples Center. It was the most impressive victory at the end. SKT is the team that starts slow and finishes even stronger. But they started this best of five with a win. And after that, there was no stopping the Korean Back in South Korea, Deft sat at home watching Faker lift the Summoner's Cup halfway around the world. I can't imagine it was easy, seeing a classmate who shared so much of your background accomplish so much in his debut year. Def's rookie campaign by comparison ended pretty forgettably, although he did have some highlights and even earned some fans. Def's teams hadn't even made a playoff series, much less come close to winning any sort of trophy. Perhaps the most significant thing that happened was when commentators noticed Deft looked a little bit like an alpaca, resulting in fans giving him his first nickname. But at the start of Season 4, Deft got his own shot at greatness. Going into 2014, MVP sold their League of Legends division to Korea's richest company, the Samsung Corporation, who went on to rebrand the teams under their flagship, now named Samsung Galaxy Ozone and Samsung Galaxy Blue. Ozone were still considered the main lineup for now, but it appeared as though Samsung wanted each roster to be equally competitive as they completely rebuilt Blue around Deft. This new lineup didn't have much time to practice together as the first tournament they'd compete in, the 2013 World Cyber Games Korean Qualifier, occurred just two weeks after Worlds ended. Here, the rookie squad was thrown into the fire immediately as they were drawn to face their sister team in the single elimination bracket. Nobody thought these fresh faces had much of a chance, but in a surprising turn of events, the rookie team upset the main roster in a narrow 2-1 series. This sent them to semifinals, where they'd now have to face off against the defending world champions, marking the first time Deft and Faker squared off in a full series elimination match. SKT had just won Worlds. Nobody expected Blue to play up to their level, but that's what made it so surprising when the series kicked off, with Faker getting solo killed. Oh, there's a cocoon. Bengi gets jumped on a lot of damage put on him by Spirit. He needs to save power to the wall, but there's Repel chasing him down. Bengi in a bit of trouble. Can he catch him? Can he get the execute? Forces the flash. Meanwhile, Pawn 1v1s Faker. No way. I gotta see the replay of that. Yeah, this is... Look at what oh, happened. Faker is. from full health as well. Yeah. And Faker comes in with the auto harass, speeding it up a little bit, trying oh, to wait oh. and see what happens. Oop. Okay, yeah, so go. Faker tries to... Oh, he Ooh. plays way too aggressively yeah. right here. Gets hit by a lot of that minion damage, and Pawn just turns around and hits him in a, with a point-blank spear to the face. One of the players Samsung had signed for Blue was a mid laner named Pawn. Originally playing under the username Wan Sok, Pawn had spent the previous year competing for an amateur team named MIG Blitz. He shared quite a few similarities to Deft and Faker, as yet another young kid from Seoul trying to make it in competitive league, albeit one that actually finished high school. Most onlookers knew very little about him or his previous year of competition at the time of his signing, but as it turned out, Pawn might have been the most dedicated player in Korean league up until that point. Across Season 3, he racked up 3,800 total solo queue matches, more than any other player in Korea. That number averages out to just over 10 games a day, every day, for a full year. All that practice paid off as he showed some flashes of brilliance with his amateur team, enough to get him an offer playing for Samsung Blue. And in this series against SKT, he played out of his mind order to pick up that second kill and make oh, sure that- Oh, Faker! It's taken out by Pawn again, he's gonna get out. Well, that and surprised me again, and wow, Faker uh, not a bit of having the there. best game, but Pawn absolutely dominating him. Yeah, really nicely done. He's gonna go down for sure. Meanwhile, in the bot lane, 
goodbye, Spirit. Another kill for SK Telecom. Vaughn. There's the Ignite, the level six finally up. Double, triple, triple kill. kill! No way, Pawn! Pawn is the new faker. <laughs> I guess it is gonna be a 2-0 for Samsung Blue. They defeat the League of Legends season three world champions in style. Wow. That is, is this real life? <laughs> insane upset. League fans across the world were stunned at how poor SKT looked. They got swept two games to zero by a rookie lineup that was now all anyone could talk about. Even international pros had to tune into the VODs and see just how this roster took down the former best team in the world. Yeah, I think that they got back to Korea right after the World Finals and started practicing for this tournament. That's my understanding. Damn, that's intense. Yep. No days off. Suspect it though. That's some hard that's, work. That's how you win a world championship. Yeah, you gotta just put the time in. I think that's like always what it comes down to being better, is just fucking put the time in. Not only was Pawn looking like one of the next great mid laners about to conquer Korea, but Deft was also playing much better himself, giving Blue a deadly two pronged attack. As time went on, fans eventually learned these carries struck up a really close friendship, which probably helped Deft and his tilting issues quite a bit. As a kid who originally got into League of Legends just as a way to have fun with friends, I'm sure it meant a lot to him developing his first close pro friendship in the esports scene. With Samsung taking down SKT, it sent waves across Korea. This was a roster made up almost entirely of young, talented stars. No first generation pros. All these players were so new, they still had their best days ahead. Realizing they were witnessing the birth of a new generation of star, Korean fans gave this roster the nickname, the Crazy High School Kids. And they might just be favorites to take the next Korean title. WCG ended with Blue losing a narrow 2-1 series to CJ Entis, but even with the slip-up, many still thought they were the squad to watch for the next Korean split, OG and Winter. This season started off a little unlucky for Blue, as they were drawn into arguably the group of death, but after splitting all their games 1-1 and securing a spot out of groups with second place, many were still very excited to see what this roster could accomplish in playoffs. It looked like this was finally Def's time to shine in the spotlight until Samsung Blue were drawn to face Faker in quarterfinals. Faker reminded everybody that SKT were the team to watch in Korea, as Samsung Blue were swept 3-0 in quarterfinals. SKT went on to win this entire winter championship without dropping a single game in group stage or bracket. Perhaps out of a desire for revenge though, Faker's best game all split came in this series against Blue, when he did something almost cruel against Pawn. See, back in that WCG qualifier when Pawn solo killed Faker, he did so with Nidalee, an AP poke mid lane mage that many fans in League thought had become way too strong. She had a long range poke with her spear coupled with a really strong heal, both of which scaled well off AP. A star mid laner using her well could snowball a game in their favor fast, which explains a little bit of how Pawn was able to snowball such an oppressive lead against Faker. In game two of this rematch series though, Faker picked AP Nidalee mid against Pawn and used her to pick Blue apart. Well, here we go. Some of Faker's insane spear plays. This was great. The Jeez. flash forward. Oh. Look at that. Just, you know, catch it up with his spear yeah. like you do. A little bit of spear goodbye. surfing. Yeah, you can. Oh man, another huge chunk taken out of Pawn there. Yeah, and uh, impact. Uh, Acorn just kind of whiffs his ult right there. Oh my, that's very nice. Nicely threaded. I mean, Faker hit pretty much everything this game. The skill shots were just, oh my. Wow. I mean, it's just like a non-stop pilot reel. Faker killing people with spears like this one. Death, more than half of his life left, doesn't matter. Goodbye. 
Pawn was still viewed as one of the best mid laners in Korea, but was now squarely behind Faker in their quickly emerging rivalry. In response to the setback, Samsung presumably felt as though they had to do something to keep their teams competitive against SKT. So they decided to move Pawn to the main lineup, swapping mids. Deft was separated from his friend, as Samsung seemed to be reminding everyone Blue were just the B team to train stars for their main squad. I don't know what the players on Blue were thinking at the time. Nobody other than the lineup themselves will ever know for sure what their emotional reaction was to this switch. It's never fun to be the little brother who has to sit back and see your sibling always stealing the spotlight. So perhaps it was this move in particular that set a fire under the team. Because after this roster swap, Blue couldn't stop winning. Spring 2014 kicked off for Blue with an immaculate group stage as the team only dropped one game out of six, sending them into their second OGN quarterfinals. Although they had lost a star mid laner in Pawn, the team had picked up another star in Dade, a mid lane prodigy from Korea's first generation of pros who previously was considered such a talented leader, he was nicknamed the General, always seen wearing a special General's jacket on stage. Dade was playing pretty well himself at the start of this split, eager to earn back some of the lost respect from a few previous disappointing campaigns on Ozone, but it was deft and his improved play that helped the team win their first quarterfinal. Coming in with the Zenith Blade onto Hart, gets knocked away immediately. Meanwhile, AV carry duel, Def nearly taking down space. Man Life trying to do something. Oh, the ult misses. Here comes Ziggs coming in with the Mega Inferno Bomb. Doesn't do much. Def finally does get the kill on the Man Life, though. Def nearly hit two people. He nearly killed space with that true shot barrage, too. Yeah. It was actually incredibly well aimed. Whoa, Coco gets knocked out. Spirit there. There's the Paul Fry's Def coming in to finish it off. And that's another kill for Def. Samsung Blue really starting to run away with this game. If Blue kept playing this well, they might have a chance to win OGN outright. But to do that, they'd first have to go through their sister squad. Ozone had been doing well with the roster swap themselves up until this point. Pawn was finding great synergy with Imp, which led to the team finishing 6-0 in group stage, then beating SK Telecom in quarterfinals, giving Pawn his own bit of revenge against Faker. Ozone were supposed to be the main lineup between these two teams after all. Even with their one lost series at WCG, this was the team who brought the organization their first title back in their MVP days. Imp was still seen as the best AD carry in either lineup, and one that didn't tilt quite as often as Deft. <laughs> With Pawn joining and making this roster even stronger, Ozone were seen as the easy favorites to win the series, putting their little brother back down in his place. Very few League fans thought Blue had any chance. And really get the smite away, Imp there as well. They're waiting for it. Red Buff still not taking Spirit a bit low. Spirit has the flash. Oh, they slow down with the briefcase. They're coming in. A lot of slows. Oh, the Dane comes with the outside looper extremely low. And there's first blood going to Imp already. Looks like they'll trade though. Yeah. Imp could be in big trouble here. Dane comes in. There's the dash. Can he get the knockup? There's a pink ward to spot Imp. There's the ignite. Dane coming in. The solar flare. So out Dane. Dane gets the ultimate though. Oh, he doesn't kill him. No, he does kill him. And now Dade fighting with Mata. He's going to get another one. Two kills and Looper is right No there. Spirits there. Yeah, Spirit has to come in trying to help. But Def may be in trouble. There's a Glitterland. Def getting low. He pops a heal. Can he get out, though? Trying to flash away. He's trying to make it. Oh, man. First blood a goes for with Spirit. The two yeah, but can he do anything with it? Oh, the double kill for Spirit. A triple kill for Spirit. There's a tidal wave engage again for Renekton. And Dade gets a great ultimate again. Gets out of the fight. Comes right back in. On to him. On to Pawn. Two kills already for Death. This is it. It's going to be an ace as Looper tries to get away. Another double kill for Spirit. They'll let him go. They'll go for the inhibitor. And with 30 plus second death timers on everybody, this is going to be it. Ozone knows it. And it may have been a little bit improbable. But after what a season Blue has had, 
it's no surprise that at the end of the day, Samsung Blue will take it 3-1. They are going to the Champion Spring Grand Finals. Samsung Blue upset Ozone off incredible play from the team top to bottom. Dade was the superstar everyone couldn't stop talking about with his highlights on Yasuo, but Deft had his own impressive moments, particularly with his mental fortitude. Ozone took game one of the series in pretty dominating fashion, the sort of stop that normally sets players on tilt. Yet Deft was unaffected, helping to carry the next two games to easy victories. Looper gets himself caught in the end. And Def should be able to finish him off. A missing shot. One more. Oh, there we go. Okay, he's going to get Red a red buff. Yep. With Blue up 2-1, Ozone responded by picking on Deft in Game 4, as if they were trying to make him tilt through constant ganks and harassment, but he never let the pressure get to him. Samsung Blue finished out the series with a victory, coming out on top, and sending the team into Grand Finals. For Deft, slaying his sister squad was the toughest part of this playoff run. In Grand Finals, he played lights out and won his first Korean championship. Samsung Blue is right on top of it, used the teleport to come in, and they're going to close here we go. Flash root prison on this effort, they're going to bring him in with the death sentence, and that type of team coordination kind of puts the nail in the, the final nail in the coffin to Najin White Shield, and it is that type of play that brought Samsung Blue through their long journey to being the champions in Champions Spring. GG! Deft always had the talent to be a star. It was just the mental blocks holding him back, which seemed as though they may have finally been vanquished. The Samsung organization was so happy to see both their squads performing at a top level, they even went so far as to rename them to Samsung Blue and Samsung White, symbolically showing they were now on the same level. In the following summer split, Blue continued their momentum, storming through the season with more great performances. They topped their group stage for a second straight time, followed it up with more victories in bracket, until they managed to face off against their sister team in semis once again. And once again, Deft played lights out. Oh, here we go, Danny. Uh, they're going in. Acorn getting back. Dade gets pushed out of the fight by Mato a little bit. Deft doing a lot of damage. Everyone flying in. A lot of AoE. And Deft on the outside doing tons. Dade. Pawn. The last one standing. Almost. Looper, of course. The real last one standing. But a double kill for Deft. That is it. That is going to be the ace. And that will also be the game. Samsung Blue coming back for a 3-1 victory over their sister team, Samsung White. They're going to the finals for the second season in a row. And they're going to leave Korea as That's the first right. seed. They the are number one. Blue crushed White three games to one, solidifying they had become the better roster and possibly the best team in Korea. They narrowly stumbled in grand finals, losing their last series, but that actually didn't matter too much because with their grand finals berth, Samsung Blue had just earned Korea's number one seed for the 2014 World Championship. Faker had his world title. Now it was Def's turn. Season 4 Worlds was an exciting time for League fans across the globe, since this was the first Riot-hosted international tournament in a full year. Nobody had seen top-tier inter-regional competition since SKT's run last season, and Deft was in a perfect position to lead Samsung Blue to repeat that performance. Blue were favorites to win Worlds going into the event. Of the three Korean teams in attendance, Blue had beaten the other two competitors head-to-head -head in spring and summer. There certainly was some question about whether or not another region could topple Korea and take Worlds for themselves, but after Blue opened the tournament thrashing China's OMG in their very first game, those thoughts were quickly put to rest. Team come around the back and OMG are caught out of position. The wave catches on towards Sand. The intervention isn't enough to save his life. The rocket jump away, but he will get burned out. Though. Go and gets caught out as well. It's a double bill for Deft, and they are just romping through them now. They have full control of that jungle. Apart from a small hiccup, the rest of group stage was a breeze for Blue, who made it out with the number one seed. It honestly felt a little like poetry. Deft's worlds began exactly like Faker's did a year ago, with a strong strong start, dropping only one match in groups. 
In bracket blue continued that performance when placed up against North America's Cloud9 in quarterfinals, who they dispatched with ease. I'm not sure which way it is. There's an Oh, pretty good. It's a good one. Hearts take it so low. They get down, don't they? But can they get anything else? Death, Death no one, no. Sneaky comes in. It's back and forth. He has to get the hell out of there for the rat -a -tat -tat. Spirit goes in towards him. He's trying to keep them up there. Oh! The exhaust goes down. High picked up. It's the ace. Once again. For Samsung Blue, it was so hopeful for a moment, but again, it's the Koreans that come out on top. With only four teams remaining, Blue were now all but guaranteed to win Worlds. That's because on the other side of the bracket, two Chinese teams would play each other for a spot in Grand Finals, both of which should be relatively easy competition for whoever faced them. Deft and Samsung Blue just had to overcome their sister team one last time. Samsung White were old news at this point. Blue had beaten them in every head-to-head -head series played this year. They came out on top when they had Pawn as their mid laner at WCG, and Blue still came out on top even after the roster swap trading the team's mids. This was the Samsung team destined to win a world championship. All they had to do was take this series avoid the chain of corruption in this fight. They do have an edge leading into this. Let's see if they pull off a gank before the dragon. Oh, here come both teleports down. It's going to be right on top of each other. Donnie gets what he wants. He is going to be out of the fight, and he also has the intervention on. Pawn almost goes down here, but he gets the brush control. Denies the vision. Oh, no. Looper gets going, and that's going to be one for this. There. Red buff on him as well. Whoever gets tagged is probably I mean, going to be tagged it? for death. They're Dandy going to turn it out. A great heal coming from Mata to save Dandy. Another jump from Looper as he gets a kill. Can Dada and the rest of the team answer? Is there any rebuttal to these kills? Whoa. Not in range for the Oswald. It flashes out. Somehow he lands. And they're going to take down Spirit as well. Not in front. Here's the disengage Here's from the Mata. Watch a collie from the back. Dottie's trying to find what he can. Death gets hit up. There's no peel for him. Chain of Corruption did go out. But as soon as Looper is let out of that prison, he is just knocking down the walls and finding more kills. A double for him. Another ace for Samsung White. It's almost a 20,000 gold lead at 26 minutes. At this point, Blue has absolutely zero chance of winning this game. Are they going to be able to get in? Danger. Dottie's this big. Is real danger. Dottie is big. That's a kill. That was what? Yes. Not good. The quick hit it's over. It's it's it goes down. Dragon goes to Pawn. Pawn gets another one. What in the world is happening right now? Too much off of that, but they do get a kill over to Dottie. Still oh. the fight continues. Pawn comes in with the jump. That just looks like he is going to chew everything up. One more hit. The double kill for Pawn as he gets a kill on Dade and Acorn. And he just gets bigger and bigger. 7 2 and 4. Now, early on in the game here, and Acorn actually gets hit again. That's going to be some big damage. The exhaust is staying in range. Oh my gosh, they actually pull off the kill as well. You can see that. They, they, they want to steal. They want to steal. Let's see what they can do. Keep oh! Going. The Prince of Thieves comes up once again, kicks away, almost to safety. That's a kill going over to Spirit, but Looper has finalized himself. One, two, possibly three with one more rip. Now he's just going to get the triple kill off an easy Q. It does not look good right now for Aiden. The quickest in this best of five series, and they do not hesitate to drop the Nexus. It's only going to take three. Samsung White finally defeats Samsung Blue. And in such a remarkable fashion, three incredibly one-sided fast games. They do it in such style, picking Akali in the top lane, Cassidy in the top lane, Assassins in the mid lane. Really, anything they felt like playing is what it felt like to finally defeat the team they could not get past. In this way, in an upset nobody predicted, Samsung White came out on top. Blue didn't just lose, they got swept. Three games to zero. The series was particularly heartbreaking for Deft, largely because it wasn't his fault. In game one, Blue constantly found themselves mispositioned, getting killed by Samsung White outnumbered over and over. While Deft did have a few misplays, he ended up being the only positive player on the team by late game, trying to farm into his AD carry power spike. Blue's mid laner, on the other hand, Dade, was making mistakes all over the place, completely outclassed by Pawn. Game 2 was closer. For a while, Blue were keeping the match tight in kills and gold, again off some stellar AD carry play from Deft. 
But once again, Blue started making a few critical errors with jungle mid and top getting caught out with really simple mistakes. This put the whole team on tilt as they started forcing one losing fight after another, always without their AD carry. Then, all the mental strength Deft had built up over the year was broken in one series. Game three was a slaughter. If we were to track through the history of League of Legends at best of fives, the accumulated kill death score and the total gold lead of that series, I doubt you'd find one worse than this one. Absolutely and it's in the semifinals of Worlds. It is miraculous what White is doing right and it's crazy. now. Rather than Blue celebrating an impending Worlds title, White were the ones off to grand finals instead. And it destroyed Deft. If seeing his classmate win Worlds last year wasn't hard enough for him, I can only imagine how overwhelming it must feel to come so close, only to be knocked out right before the finish line. Instead, it was Pawn that got to move on, reclaiming his status as one of the best mid laners in the game. When both teams took the stage after the series to take a bow, Blue's mid laner Dade gave his special general's jacket to Pawn, telling him to go off and win the World Championship. Pawn was able to do exactly that, as he alongside Imp made their way to Grand Finals where China's RNG couldn't match up to their level. Samsung White crushed them three games to one, earning Pawn his first World Championship, and Samsung their first as an organization. First Nexus, sorry, is gonna fall. Only Lulu really there to stop them. The second Nexus, sorry, fall. They're gonna focus in on the Nexus itself, and Samsung White for the 2014 What a sight. Just what an extraordinary world championship Samsung White has had. Dandy's Red Guard. By the end of Season 4, League of Legends had officially been out for half a decade, and at this point in that lengthy history, there had never been a player or team who remained at the top of the game for long. There was never a repeat world champion, or a star who could call themselves best in the game for more than a season or two. One generation came along to reach the top only to be overthrown by the next, which is why many thought this story was coming to an end. The crazy high school kids came into League and had their day in the sun. They reached the top, won some world championships, or at least came pretty damn close, and played some great League of Legends all along the way. But it was only a matter of time until the next generation took over. Nobody expected this story to continue, but of course, it did. We didn't know it at the time, but Deft and Faker were special. They weren't just great League of Legends players who were the best of their era, they were two of the best of all time. These high school rivals were destined to be locked in a struggle to overthrow each other that would go on for many more years after this. They'd fight for Korean championships, world titles, and the status of best in the game over and over again. In fact, they're about to face off at an international grand final where Deft will make the riskiest gamble in League of Legends history.